we're going to be talking about all the different types of equipment that we're going to be using in the laboratory, and we're going to finish with talking about safety. Here we go. So let's get right into it. We'll start with this, the workhorse of the chemistry lab. This is a beaker. Now beakers are used when you have a situation in which there's very little likelihood of splattering to take place. Reactions that aren't very vigorous or just plain mixing, a beaker is used for that. If you do expect it to be a little more vigorous, then we use the Erlenmeyer flask. Notice the conical shape and that prevents anything from splattering out when you're mixing. Here's another one you've probably seen before. The test tube, pretty self-explanatory. We use these when we have smaller amounts of chemicals to mix together. You might run across one of these from time to time. These are rubber stoppers, pretty self-explanatory. You can use them for test tubes or for Erlenmeyer flasks, whatever. Some stoppers have holes in them so that you can use them for things like putting a thermometer through. Here's a test tube rack, again, pretty self-explanatory. These posts can be used for allowing the test tube to air dry once it's been rinsed out. These are called graduated cylinders. Graduated because you'll notice the lines all the way up that give very accurate measurements of volumes. You have them in varying sizes. This one has a 100 milliliter capacity. This one has a 50. There are smaller ones. We have 25s and 10s. If you're wondering about this plastic ring right here, that's to help the graduated cylinder from breaking if it happens to tip over. This is called a volumetric flask. If you look closely, you can see a line right here. That line is used for very precise measuring of the contents within this flask. If we wanted to make 200 milliliters of solution, we would use this line and allow the curved portion of our liquid to sit right on that line. And that would give us precisely 200 milliliters in this case. This is a dropper, pretty self-explanatory, when we have little tiny amounts of volume that we need to transfer. This is called a rubber bulb. This is a disposable pipette. Again, when you need to transfer small volumes of liquid. We also have some that give us very precise measurements. This is a volumetric pipette. And again, notice the little line right there. We use this line the same way we do for a volumetric flask. When we want to transfer exact amounts of liquid. This one happens to transfer exactly 10 milliliters. Now to pull the liquid into the pipette, we may use one of these, a roller. So we gently place the roller on the end of the pipette. Notice I have my other hand very close to the end. I don't want to have my hand way down here and put pressure on this pipette. Otherwise, it may snap, and if I get that in my hand, it's going to hurt. So I put my hand very close to the end, and I put the roller on like so. And notice when I roll the wheel, the plunger comes up. So watch. As I roll the wheel, you'll see liquid come up into the pipette, like so. And I can use the roller to get the liquid precisely where I want it to be, right about there. When I want to release the liquid, I simply press this lever, and that allows for the release of the liquid. See that? Here's another way we might pull liquid into a pipette. This special bulb has valves to help us to pull the liquid very precisely into the pipette. If I press this valve right here, it allows me to press the bulb so now it will pull liquid into the pipette. And then I simply use the other valves and like before with the roller, I can get a specific amount into my pipette. To release it, I can press this valve right here and there it goes. This is a watch glass. This can be used in various ways from allowing a wet solid to dry or to cover a beaker like so. This is called an evaporating dish. We can gently heat a stable solid in this evaporating dish, and it will take the liquid away, leaving the solid. This is called a crucible. Here's a lid for it. A crucible is used when you have something that needs to be more intensively heated, say with a torch. This is called a mortar and pestle. This is used for taking solids that need to be crushed into powder. This is an iron stand, and this is an iron ring. You simply clamp the iron ring onto the stand like this, and then you might use something like this. This is called wire gauze. This material in the center allows for the heat to be distributed a little more evenly, and it's also fireproof. So we can use things like a torch. 
Sometimes, though, if we're heating a crucible, the wire gauze doesn't exactly do what we need it to do. So instead, we use what's called a clay triangle because it's made of wood and it's square shaped. The clay triangle sits on the ring like so and allows us a more stable platform for the crucible. Now, we certainly don't want to burn our hands while we're taking things on and off of heat, so we have things like this. These are beaker tongs used for transporting hot beakers. But beaker tongs aren't the right size for crucibles, so instead we use crucible tongs, a little bit more narrow, and we can do things like pull the lid off the crucible if we need to. Crucible tongs should not be used to transport hot beakers, but crucible tongs are too big for test tubes. That's why we have test tube holders. There you go. Here's some other items you might use during the course of the year. This is a lab scoop. It's used for scooping solids. This is called a metal spatula. We use it for transferring solids. This is called a glass stirring rod. I hope I don't have to explain why. A glass stirring rod is also good for transferring drops at a time of solution. To light a torch, we use one of these. This is called a striker. It has a piece of flint inside that produces sparks. So we carefully turn on the gas and we spark like so. Now please don't be wasteful. Don't wear out the flint just because you want to see it spark. This is a hot plate. Sometimes we'll use it for more gentle heating. Here's a balance or scale. We obviously use this for masses. We don't want to dump solids onto the scale by themselves, so we use one of these, a weighing boat. You might see them in plastic or aluminum like this. If we use the weighing boat, we can use it one of two ways. First, we can take the mass of the weighing boat by itself. And then, once we put the solid in, we can subtract the mass of the weighing boat, knowing how much solid we have. Or, we can place the weighing boat on the scale and use the tear button. And that will cause the scale to zero out. And then, whatever solid you put into the weighing boat, you'll have the proper mass. This is called a burette clamp. It goes on the stand like so. A burette clamp holds a burette. It's a long tube, as you can see, that has graduations on it, just like the graduated cylinder. At one end, we have a valve. Using a funnel, we can put the liquid into the burette. The burette clamp allows for better positioning of our burette. Once we get it where we like, then we can open the valve and allow for the transfer of liquid into a flask. This is something I think is pretty cool. It's called a magnetic stirrer. If you have a solution and you don't want to be constantly stirring that solution, you can use this little magnetic bar and place it in the solution, like so. Then, when you turn on the magnetic stirrer, it causes the bar to rotate and it stirs your solution for you. Not bad. Now that's not by any means an exhaustive list of equipment you'll find in the chemistry lab, but if you recognize those pieces, that's a great start. Now let's take a few moments and talk about safety in the laboratory. And it starts with these right here, safety glasses. We don't do anything, anything in the laboratory without having safety glasses on to protect your eyes at all times. Also, if you have long hair, you really need to tie it up before the lab starts. And this is to protect you. Say we're using a Bunsen burner, for example, in the laboratory. The last thing you want is to catch your hair on fire. So slim, you got to put it up. This, by the way, is a fume hood. A fume hood is used if we have a reaction that produces, well, fumes, or just noxious odors in general. To get rid of those fumes, we simply turn on the blower. And the blower sucks all those noxious fumes out and away from the laboratory. Another handy feature of this fume hood is that it has this glass shield. So let's say that we have a chemical reaction and we're producing a whole lot of fumes. We can turn the blower on and then we simply... Slim! Another thing that's obviously very important for us to know is where the fire extinguisher is and where the fire blanket is. Here's the fire blanket. It's right next to our goggle sanitation cabinet. And this is the way the fire blanket works. You'll notice there's a loop right here. It says, pull loop with right hand and revolve body to left. So as long as you know your left from your right, it's really easy. So I grab it with my right hand. 
And there you go. So in the event you have something catch on fire, like a sleeve or something like that, you run over here to the fire blanket and do exactly what I've just done. After we're finished using our goggles for the day, we always put them back in our sanitation cabinet. And this uses UV rays to sanitize the goggles after every use. Pretty cool, huh? As you can see, our fire extinguisher is right here near the door of the laboratory. So pretty easy to find. If you need the extinguisher, you simply take it off the wall and then follow the instructions that are written right here on the front. Now we're probably not going to get anything in our eyes, are we? But let's say the outside chance that something did get in our eyes, this is the eye wash station. We have a station here at the faucet and we also have a backup. These are sterile bottles of eye wash. They also serve to wash your eyes out in the event of an emergency. And they're placed right there. To use the eye wash, it's very simple. First, we turn on the water, and then we pull this knob right here. If you have to do this, it's really important to hold your eyes open gently and to kind of pull your lids in such a way as to allow that water to flush your eyes of any possible chemical contamination. It's real important to have an uncluttered area during a lab activity. So, because of that, let's keep all of our book bags off the table, all of our books off the table with maybe the exception of your lab notebook, and definitely no food or drinks while we're performing a lab experiment. If we're heating something in a test tube, first, always use a test tube holder. Come on. Like that. And then as you're heating the test tube, always, always make certain that the opening of the test tube never faces you or anybody else. Oh, Slim, are you crazy? Look, we never ever heat a sealed flask like this on a hot plate or on a burner or anything. That sealed flask could build up pressure and eventually burst, and that could cause shards of glass to shoot out. That's bad. We don't want shards of glass in the laboratory. Come on, man. It should also go without saying that we always, always keep any flammable substances away from heat sources like this. You should never perform an experiment without anyone else being around, especially me. No unauthorized experiments. All right, Slim's going to help me with the editing on this one. All right, Slim, you ready? Okay, when I tell you which one, make sure you put it, you got it? Okay, all right, here we go. There are several safety symbols that you should be familiar with. This first symbol right here means that... This means that the item that you're using is flammable, to be careful not to get any open flame near it. Okay, you got it this time? Okay. This one means... Oh, for goodness sakes. This means that the items that you're using are sharp and can puncture your skin, so be very careful. And here's an important one. Ha ha ha! Gotcha. Eye safety. Always, always wear your eye goggles. But really, that should go without saying. Let's talk about clothing for a second. It's real important to wear clothing that doesn't dangle very much or isn't very baggy. You don't want it to be dragging it through a chemical or catching it on fire. And also, wear closed-toed shoes just in case you drop something. Now, unless you want to be like Slim here, you never ever want to taste anything that comes from a test tube, a flask, a beaker. You get the idea. Don't taste things in the chemistry lab. If I'm making a dilute solution of acid, a less concentrated solution, I always put the acid into the water. I don't put the water into the acid. Putting water into the acid could result in a reaction that causes that to splatter all over you. And we don't want that. So always put the acid into the water. Never leave a spill for someone else to get. Go ahead and make sure that we know about the spill and then let's clean it up. I'm looking at you, Slim. Because there's no one else in here, that's why. You'll find a complete list of all the safety precautions in section four of chapter one. Certain labs may require specific instructions. So always, always listen to what I tell you. That's the safest thing of all. So that's all the time we have for today. I hope this has been helpful for you to understand safety in the laboratory. And as always, if I can help you in any way, just let me know. Until the next time, God bless.